Hi, this is Chaplain Greg with The Wandering Wesley, and, and uh, today we're going to continue our talk about the Apostle Paul, and especially a theme that he has uh, throughout his letters on election and predestination. So you've probably heard that mentioned before. Um, if you have Reformed friends, or if you're, you yourself are Reformed or, or uh, a Calvinist, then you probably have a completely different understanding of predestination election than what I'm going to present here. This was a, a sermon that I presented from my office way back in COVID days um, to a, a small vineyard church. So um, it, it's from my office. It's not standing up at a podium. Uh, the, uh, the video and audio is a little wonky, but uh, I, it, it's clear enough that I think you'll, you'll uh, get a lot out of it. Um, share your thoughts. If you are enjoying this content, please like and subscribe, share your thoughts, share the video. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you, but uh, until then, here is a uh, quick sermon, it's not long, on Ephesians 1, 1 through 6, I believe. God bless. You guys, but uh, one of the things I wanted to do, because we are starting the book of Ephesians, uh, when Ben told me that he wanted to do the book of Ephesians, I said, Ephesians, I said, you know, there's a big landmine right in the first chapter in the first 14 verses. It's a theological landmine that uh, since really the 16th century and the Reformation has been a, a point of contention between some Christians. Um, it wasn't a problem for uh, Christians for the first 1500 years of the church's existence, except for Augustine brought it up for a few years but uh, he was his his view and the view of uh, reformers like Calvin and Luther was salvation and how God predetermines who is saved and who is not saved and I realized that there are a number of people within our congregation who probably have come from a tradition who you've been taught that that's been uh, what you understood especially this passage Ephesians 1 1 through 14 that this is what that passage means and largely the Christian Church doesn't believe that um, the reformed end uh, whether you are reformed Orthodox Presbyterian Orthodox Congregational the Orthodox Congregational churches come from the Puritans who are very Calvinistic and uh, maybe some Southern Baptists, because Southern Baptists are about half and half as far as uh, Calvinists and those that uh, affirm what we call provisionism. Provisionism means that God provides salvation to everybody. It isn't limited, part of the tulip, it, it isn't limited to just those who God predetermines beforehand. So if you've been raised, or if you are in that tradition, if you still hold to those beliefs, I'd ask that you just bear with me with uh, this examination of, of, of Ephesians 1. Um, if anything, just to have a, a good idea of what the other side teaches. Uh, you really don't know your own opinion, you, you don't really know your own view until you can faithfully argue the other position's view. And uh, this is something that I've had to learn the hard way. But it's true, not just for theology, but it's also true for politics and philosophy, worldviews. Know what the other person thinks and why they think it and be able to repeat it back to them in a way they nod their head and say, yeah, you got it, you understand it. Um, so the way we're going to be approaching Ephesians is through the idea of the book of Ephesians talking about spiritual warfare. And Ephesians 1, 1 through 14 is talking about the army that you're joining in spiritual warfare. And I don't think it's any accident that uh, we're talking about this the weekend of D-Day, celebrating when the British, Canadian, American forces invaded Normandy to, to drive the Germans back to Germany out of France and the rest of Europe. And um, those soldiers that fought in D-Day, most of them were drafted, conscripted soldiers, but I would also say that most of them wanted to be there. Most of them knew the existential evil 
that was Nazi Germany. And they knew that the world's freedom and the world's, um, the, the, the world's character needed to be rid of Nazism and the hatred that comes from that particular ideology. So these soldiers faced that existential evil. They chose to do it. Even if they were drafted, they could choose to be conscientious objectors or, or draft dodgers. But they chose to be there that day. And when we are in the church and we're facing spiritual warfare, we need to know the army that we've chosen to be a part of. Now, one of the things I want to do before I get into the text is I want to define the idea of free will. So free will is dependent upon the creature's nature. Now let me explain that. I have a cardinal that lives in our backyard. Beautiful bird. And he sings to us every morning as Carrie and I are out on the back porch. And he flies from tree to tree to tree up to our house over to the neighbor's house, back to trees. Um, it's in his nature to choose to fly from one tree to the top of my house, to the top of my neighbor's house. He's choo because of his nature, he can fly. I, on the other hand, if I were to go up to the top of my house, and if I were to choose to fly, I could choose to leap off the house, but I could not choose to fly. Why? Because my nature is that gravity takes over and I plummet. So a person's free will is dependent upon their nature. And that also goes for salvation. Because we can't choose any other way but Jesus. God has made that predetermined choice of either Jesus or not. If you want to be with God, you go through Jesus. If you don't want to be with God, if you want to do your own thing, God will let you do that. But you're, you're not free to say, well, you know, I, I don't like Christianity, but I like Buddhism, so I think I'm going to go through Buddhism instead. That's not an option. That's not part of our nature. So we can't, we, if we freely choose to go any other route but Jesus, we are choosing to reject God. So, with that, let's take a look at Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. And most preachers and teachers, when they, when they read this passage, they gloss over verses 1 and 2 and go straight to verse 3. But I want to spend some time on verses 1 and 2 because they're very, very important. So, here it is, uh, Ephesians 1, 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will to the faithful saints in Jesus Christ at Ephesus grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is an apostle. That's the first thing. He, he's identifying himself as an apostle by God's will. God gave him that designation of an apostle. He could have freely chosen to reject it, but because of the overwhelming love of, of Jesus, and in fact Paul did reject it, uh, throughout much of his Pharisaic life, you know, that he uh, was involved with the stoning of Stephen. So, you know, he, he did a good job of rejecting it for a while, but he finally, with the, with the intervention of Jesus, chose to accept his role, that predestined role that God had for him in as being an apostle. So the, the other part I want us to look at is the term to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. So whenever we look at a passage of scripture, we have to ask ourselves, who is this scripture written towards? And you've heard me talk about the three audiences, the audience that uh, first heard it, the audience that may be experiencing something right then and there in the passage, and then us today. To, for, to really understand the passage, you need to understand who it's written to. And so, knowing the author, when uh, knowing whom an author is writing to when doing biblical exegesis is essential in understanding the context of the entire 
book that you're studying. So as we go through this passage, I want you to remember who Paul is writing to. The faithful saints in Jesus Christ. The faithful saints. Now what does that mean? So, pistos and kairoesus. So, uh, that means the faithful saints, pistos, uh, is, uh, Christos, Isus, um, which is in, of Jesus Christ. The faithful saints of Jesus Christ. The word faithful, pistos, pistois, actually, it refers to those who have willingly put their trust into something. So I could have pistois in, um, I could have pistois in my job. You know, I have faith that my job will pay me someday, uh, every other week, hopefully. Um, so I have faith that that will happen. I am deciding to put my faith in that. This is the key to pistois, or pistos is the actual root word. The key is that there's no outside force predetermining that trust. It is a trust that comes from within the individual. It's an act of the individual agent, which then puts that agent into the group of the faithful saints. If we're putting our faith into Christ Jesus, the faithful saints in Christ Jesus, if we're putting our faith in Jesus, then we are part of this group, this us that Paul's going to be talking about. So let's move on. Now it's time to get to verse 3. And it, verse 3 says, Blessed is God, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavens in Christ. So again, remember, every time Paul is using the word us, he's talking about whom? The faithful saints. Now the sticky part comes in verses 5 through 6, and this is where Christians start having a little bit of controversy and, and theological debate. Verses 5 and 6 says, He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory, glorious grace that he lavished on us in the Beloved One. So, let's look at the sticky word, predestined, which is pro-o, pro o rizu, pro -o -rizu. and that word means to limit in advance. It's predeterminative, determined before, ordained, or predestined. This is the language of predetermination, but remember who is being predetermined. It's not the individual, it's the group. Who? The faithful saints of Jesus Christ. You join the faithful saints of Jesus Christ, which is the predestined, pro orizu, the predestined group that's going to be saved. It's not the individual, it's the group. So, let's take an illustration. I, when, when we lived in Rockport, Massachusetts, um, my job was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right across the Charles River from downtown Boston. So I frequently took uh, the train from Rockport all the way down to North Station in Boston. That train had a predestined destination of North Station. Now, some days I chose to be on the train. Sometimes I, I chose to work from home. Sometimes I chose to drive in. Um, but that train was always predestined to go to North Station. If I chose to get on the train, I could have gotten off the train, let's say, at Beverly Farms or uh, Salem and not go to North Station. But that train is still going to North Station. It's predestined, predetermined to go to North Station. If I stay on the train, I will be a part of the predestined group on that train to reach North Station. 
So this word that Paul uses, proorizo, this word is used six times by him in the New Testament, and it's never used in the context of an individual. It's always used in the context of a group. Now for the next section. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made him known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he, that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. Here we see exclusively the exclusivity of the group, okay? There is redemption and forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. The plan of salvation was God's predestined plan from the beginning, and there was no other plan. The plan speaks to the limited nature of our free will. I can't choose any other way to God other than through Jesus. It'd be like saying that the train to Boston is the only method for getting to North Station. Um, I can't drive, walk, fly, or parachute. I can only take the train. That's what this part of the passage is talking about. There is redemption through the blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. There's no other way other than that. So we aren't free to choose any other way except to either choose that gift of salvation or reject it. The next section, in him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according, remember we, who's we? The faithful saints of Jesus Christ. Because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with purpose of his will so that we, the faithful saints of Jesus Christ, who had already put our hope in Christ, so that we who had already, so here's the choice beforehand, we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. So because we have cho chosen to join the predestined group, the faithful saints in, of Jesus Christ, we participate in the predetermined state of forgiveness and unity with God. God worked it out for us. Now notice this phrase, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ, this is the language of choice. We are members of that group, and if we have put our faith, and we've chosen to put our hope in Christ, our decision to follow Christ brings praise to his glory. And so the last two verses, in him you also were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation when you believed, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Here's the payoff, the Holy Spirit. The payoff is the beginning of our ability to commit to spiritual warfare. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit as a kind of uniform. The Holy Spirit marks us as a child of God. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen any uh, Jap Japanese samurai films, but there's a few of them out there, and they are usually known for these grand battles. And these huge battles are marked by armies that have these flagpoles that stick up from their back. They wear these flagpoles with the flag of whatever army you're with. The Holy Spirit is that flag on us, okay? Paul describes the reception of the Holy Spirit as a down payment of our inheritance. Our inheritance, once we have joined the predestined army, is redemption. So the question comes back to us as individuals. Have we made that decision to join God's army in spiritual warfare? Have we put our faith and our trust into Jesus as the only means to be unified with God, which is guaranteed by his predetermination? Or have we chosen to reject that offer of grace? 